Welcome back, friends. So now we discuss General Joe Johnson and how he and the Army of Northern Virginia began a thing. Be began as a thing. Uh, now this is going to be another weird part of our series because back in our Gettysburg series, I did a bio on Robert E. Lee and James Longstreet. So um, in lieu of that, I'll probably do a video on St Thomas Stonewall Jackson. But today we will be discussing the Army of Northern Virginia from the spring of 1862 all the way to the fall of 1862. But as always, if we're new viewers, I welcome you to subscribe. We have a great grown community here. Um, I have new content every day. And if you're a returning viewer, please like, share, and comment. And let's get into it. So again, the districts of the South were put under command of specific generals. However, on the Union side, the plan was that the Army of the Potomac, commanded by George B. McClellan, would land at Fort Monroe, Virginia, then pull the Confederate forces, all the districts, towards the peninsula to defend Richmond from an eastern invasion. Then three other Union forces would come down through the Shenandoah Valley, secure certain positions, and then strike at the Valley District of 17,000 men under Thomas Jackson. Now, the Valley and Peninsula campaigns were happening at the same time as each other, but I will go over the Valley first, simply because it was four months long, whereas the Peninsula was five months. The first action would be at the Battle of Kernstown on March 23rd, 1864. Colonel Nathan Kimball, in place of General Nathaniel Banks, led the Army of the Shenandoah against Jackson's district forces. Though a Union victory, it frightened Abraham Lincoln enough that Jackson was able to move his troops so quickly. So Lincoln ordered John Fremont, who was stationed in the Allegheny Ridge, to move into the valley, and also commanded Irvin McDowell, who was stationed at Fredericksburg, to move his forces west to pacify Jackson. And he also ordered Nathaniel Banks to return to finish off Jackson and leave the valley open to federal troops. Jackson would engage with the Union forces at McDowell, Front Royal, Winchester, Goods Farm, Cross Keys, and Port Royal, all complete Confederate victories. The Union forces were thrown out of the valley and Jackson into legend that he routed three Federal forces. Jackson would then transfer to join the main army in the peninsula. Meanwhile in the peninsula, things were faring well too. Johnson, having known McClellan, was fully aware of his tactics and style of fighting, so he was able to continue to pull him inland, away from the Federal fleet and his supply line. And McClellan's caution was not helping his force. Most of the fighting had been draws, but the Battle of Seven Pines, May 31st to June 1st, 1862, the battle ended in a draw, but importantly for the Union, General Joe Johnson was wounded by artillery shrapnel. The Confederate government acted quickly. Jefferson Davis then named General Robert E. Lee as the com new commander of the Army of North Virginia. During the Seven Days Battle, June 25th, July 1st, Robert E. Lee will push McClellan's army of 114,000 troops back to Harrison's Landing. Lee at this point no longer saw McClellan as a realistic threat to Richmond. But intelligence told Lee that General John Pope and his army of Virginia, with elements of the Army of the Potomac, were going to plunge into Virginia and make a long front and connect to McClellan in the, pen the peninsula. Pope's army was made up of forces Jackson had crushed in the Valley Campaign, and also uh, those forces defending Washington, D.C. Lee, who was more Napoleon when it came to speed than McClellan, moved Jackson's troops to Cedar Mountain. Banks will be defeated and the Confederates would stall the push towards McClellan. Pope would try to strike at Rappahannock Station August 22nd to 25th at the first battle of Rappahannock Station. Longstreet will throw back the next attempt to push through. At Jackson's Manassas operations and Longstreet's thoroughfare gap, they both beat Union forces soundly once again. This would culminate into the Battle of of 2nd Manassas on August 28th to 30th, 
where Robert E. Lee would defeat Pope's army. On the very same ground that the first battle of the war was fought, that Johnson had beaten Urban McDowell's army. One more action will be fought at Chantilly, with which ended in a draw. This was a blessing for the Federals, whose entire army was saved from complete destruction, something Lee would consider his greatest mistake in the campaign. But in the wake of the Northern Virginia campaign, Lee felt a morale boost to his newly organized army. He had now reorganized the army into two Grand Corps. The first Grand Corps was being commanded by General, well, Lieutenant General James Longstreet, with the divisions of Lafayette McClaws, John Bell Hood, Richard Anderson, David Jones, and John Walker. Then the second Grand Corps was commanded by Thomas Stonewall Jackson, with the divisions of Alexander Lawton, A.P. Hill, D.H. Hill, and John R. Jones. Lee made a new plan. He wanted to take the war to the north. He wanted them to feel what Virginia had been feeling for almost the past two years. He also wanted to claim supplies for his army, which were running low due to the large, uh, ex largely extended supply lines to Texas for the supplies coming in from Europe. Also, cut the Baltimore rail line between Washington and Baltimore to cut the capital off from their supplies. And finally, a hope to get reinforcements from Maryland, which was a slave state, but stayed loyal to the Union. The Confederate forces would see success at Mile Hill and Harper's Ferry, but at the Battle of Cranton's Gap, the Union would push the Confederate back. But all that would do is give Jackson a chance to link back with the main army. On September 14th, the two forces would clash at the Battle of South Mountain. Though a Union victory, it indirectly caused the Confederate victory at Harper's Ferry. The two armies would clash again on September 17th at Sharpsburg, Maryland. The Battle of Antietam would be the single bloodiest day on American soil. 3,600 dead day of the battle. And then overall casualties, 22,700 men. Lee would then withdraw back into Virginia as the season began to turn, and he deployed his corps for winter quarters. Or so he thought. Thanks for watching, friends. Our next episode will be covering the Second Waterloo, the Battle of Fredericksburg. Again, this series will go a little quicker because it's not as extensive and not as many commanders as the Army of the Potomac series. But as always, new viewers, hope I earned your new subscription. And for everyone else, please like, share, and comment. And we will see you in the next one on the slopes of Mari's Heights.